good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is for you. I am so glad you are joining us for this online worship video from First Parish Church of Kingston, Massachusetts. I am the Reverend Monica Jacobson Tennyson. I serve this church as its minister, and I use she, her pronouns. Today marks the beginning of a period of filming our worship videos across many different locations, bringing pieces from the homes of staff members and the voices of members of our choir and weaving them together into one whole offering, which you are invited to take part in. Across all these different locations, may we remember that we have what we most need, love and commitment and courage and inner strength. To affirm that truth, please join with me in singing our introit, What We Need Is Here. chalice available to you today, or a candle, or the worship web app on your smartphone, you are invited to join with me in lighting a chalice. Along with Unitarian Universalists all over the country and all over the world, we share today in worshiping at a distance. As you gaze at your flame or picture a chalice flame in your mind, may you remember that we are all creating points of light. And together, those points of light make a constellation of love and justice stretching across many places and reaching back centuries into the past. May we carry this light forward into the future. Hi, Reverend Monica. Hi, Jen. How are you today? I'm doing well. You can see I have someone with me today. Yeah, hi Ellery, it's nice to see you. You know Ellery, but some people who are watching might not know Ellery. So this is Ellery Churchmouse, and he usually lives in my office in the RA space. But since we can't be at church together for a while, Ellery decided to come home and live with me and my family. And we have been showing some of the things that he's been up to on Facebook and Instagram, and trying to connect with people that way, even though we can't be at church. I think those are great tools for this time. We have things like social media to let us show our friends and our family little bits of what we're doing with our days and tell them little stories. And then we can video chat like this so we can talk to people even when we can't be together in the same place. Yeah, that's right. Well, I thought it would be a good idea to come on to Zoom today and have a conversation with you because while Ellery has been at home with my family, he's been talking a lot about having big feelings about things being different. Mm -hmm. Especially now that it's Easter, he's been wondering a lot and worrying a lot about this holiday being different than it always is. And I said to him that sometimes when we're having big feelings, one of the people we can talk to is our minister. Very often, our ministers have really good ideas about how we could be thinking 
about our feelings and our reactions and that sort of thing. So I thought it would be a good idea to come on and talk to you about how this year Easter really is going to be different and it's okay to feel our feelings about that. Yeah, thank you for bringing Ellery to me. So Ellery, the first thing I wanna tell you is that a lot of people are having a lot of big feelings right now. People of every single age, big people, little people, human people, mouse people, everyone is having big feelings right now. And one reason for that is that we have what's called the fight, flight, or freeze response, which means that when we feel stressed or unsafe, our bodies try to protect us by getting us ready to fight off a danger or run away from a danger or get really small and quiet and hide from a danger. And we've never lived in a danger like a pandemic before. So our bodies don't really know what to do. So they're trying all the responses. So sometimes people are feeling really angry. They're feeling really angry that the virus is here, that it means they can't do the things they want to do. And that's that fight response. That's your body saying, I want to feel safe and good again. And maybe if I get really mad and fight something, it'll help. But the way we fight a virus is by staying home. Or maybe you feel like this is just really awful and I wish I could run away and I don't want to talk to anybody. That's the flight response, which if a lion was trying to eat you, it would be really good for your body to want to run away. But you can't run away from a virus. You have to stay in your house so that you don't get exposed and get sick and carry it to other people. And some people are feeling really tired and sad, like they don't want to get out of bed. Maybe their body feels really cold and they start to worry that they're never going to feel happy ever again. And that's the freeze response. And again, if some big creature was trying to eat you, it would be really helpful for you to curl up into a little ball so that the creature wouldn't know where you were and it would go away. But in this case, even though we have to stay in our houses, it's not helpful for us to stay in bed all day, every day. We still wanna get up and have our routine and spend time with people and you know, move around maybe in our yard or we can go to a park and walk at a safe distance from others. So all those feelings are happening in your body because your body thinks it might help you to feel those big things. And those things aren't gonna get us out of this problem, but it's also, okay and important to feel them because trying to pretend you don't feel something doesn't make the feeling go away it just makes it harder so i think the most important thing we can do when we have those feelings is to say to ourselves oh okay i feel mad right now it's okay for me to feel mad maybe i want to do something with my mad like i want to find a pillow and hit it with my fist or i want to go outside and throw a rock that's okay. And you can say, oh, I feel like I wanna run away. I feel really scared. Well, you can go run around a little bit if you have a safe outdoor place to do it, or you can do some jumping jacks. You can do something to help your body move and use that energy. And if you're feeling the freeze response, like you're just so tired and sad and cold, it is okay to sleep in or take a nap. It's okay to stay in bed for a while. But if you notice that you're staying in bed all day, every day for several days in a row, then you probably need someone you trust to talk to about those feelings and help you figure out what else you can do besides stay in bed all the time. But mostly I wanna say our poor bodies are so confused that sometimes we feel all of those big feelings in the same day because we just, we've never lived in a pandemic before. We don't know what's gonna help us. It's very different than trying to run away from a lion that wants to eat you. Mm. It's really different. But I think that all of those suggestions were really helpful. And I think in our family, we're going to be trying to use them this coming week. So thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk to us about that. Sure. I want to say one more thing too, which is that sometimes a big feeling we're having in this time is gratitude. 
or wonder or joy because all mixed up in all these other feelings about hard things are our feelings about the fact that it's spring and we're alive and maybe we're spending extra time with people we love or we're having conversations with people who are special to us but who we don't talk to very often. So you might be having big, good feelings too. And it might be confusing to have big, good feelings and big, hard feelings at the same time. And that's just part of being human, is that everything is all mixed up inside you and it's all okay. You can feel every feeling you have. So I'm glad you came to talk to me today, Ellery. I really appreciate that. I'm glad Jen helped you get connected. I'm so glad that we have a minister that we can come to. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. This is still a time for us to celebrate what there is to celebrate in this world. So in that spirit, please join with me in singing hymn number 269, Lo, the day of days is here. sometimes light in recognition of the fact that this is a hard time to be alive and human in this world. When we light them, we remember that the Reverend Rebecca Parker says that in times like these, we must choose our guides carefully. It would be easy to be guided by fear by the instinctive part of us that says we need to save ourselves and our loved ones and not worry about any of those other people. It would be easy to be guided into despair, to find ourselves saying, what's the point? No one can do anything about everything that's wrong. The problems of the world are too big. But our task as religious people is to choose our guides carefully. To say, yes, there is so much suffering in the world and we grieve the loss of so much from the small pleasures of our days to the end of human lives. To 
face our grief without turning away, to breathe through it, to feel how compassion for others and for ourselves comes alongside that grief. We will light this white candle for our grief and for our compassion. A white candle for our grief and our compassion that they may help to guide us. And we are guided too by the fact that we can make choices that make a difference. These choices are not always easy and they are never perfect, but choices and changes are possible. Right now we are choosing to stay home, to flatten the curve, to protect all those around us from the spread of this virus. And we have more choices we can make. We can reach out to a struggling neighbor. We can choose where we donate our resources to help make a difference. We can change the way we eat and the way we garden. We can be brave enough to ask for help when we are struggling. We will light this red candle for commitment and courage. A red candle for the commitment and the courage that it takes to make change in our lives and in this world. Our grief, our compassion, our commitment, our courage, may these be our guides in this time in the world. May it be so.
In this time of creating community at a distance, we gather on Zoom to share our personal joys and sorrows with each other. At this time, I will light these candles, red for love and courage, and gold for gratitude and blessing. A red candle for all the healthcare providers who are answering the call to help and to heal. A red candle for all the essential workers who are helping us to get what we need and making our spaces cleaner and safer. A red candle for all those who are made vulnerable by their circumstances those who are unhoused, imprisoned, undocumented, or at risk because of those with whom they shelter. And a red candle for those for whom today is a hard day, those who struggle with mental illness, financial insecurity, and other worries. And a gold candle for leaders all over the world, from the national to the local levels, making the best choices they can in the service of us all. A gold candle for scientists racing to understand the virus and to create tests and vaccines. A gold candle for artists and creators who offer words and music and art to sustain our spirits in this time. A gold candle for all the generous people giving to food banks and making masks and sharing what they have. A gold candle for the coming of spring once more to this beautiful, fragile world. And a gold candle for love, which is present now in us and with us and through us. Please join with me in singing Hymn number 266, Now the Green Blade Riseth. Instructions on Not Giving Up by Ada Limon. More than the fuchsia funnels breaking out of the crab apple tree, 
more than the neighbor's almost obscene display of cherry limbs, shoving their cotton candy colored blossoms to the slate sky of spring rains. It's the greening of trees that really gets me. When all the shock of white and taffy, the world's baubles and trinkets leave the pavement strewn with the confetti of aftermath, the leaves come. Patient, plodding, a green skin growing over whatever winter did to us. A return to the strange idea of continuous living despite the mess of us, the hurt, the empty. Fine then, I'll take it, the tree seems to say. A new slick leaf unfurling like a fist to an open palm. I'll take it all. Please join with me in singing hymn number 1068, Rising Green. who are Jewish. It's Holy Week and Easter for those of us who are Christian. And for those of us who are neither Jewish nor Christian, it is still a time to learn from these ancient stories. These stories which do not shy away from the truth of human suffering. The story of Passover is the story of the prophet Moses whom God sends to ask Pharaoh to free the Israelites who have been slaves in Egypt. Each time Pharaoh refuses, God sends a plague upon the land. Dara Lind writes that the plagues include agricultural blights such as locusts, diseases such as boils, supernatural or astronomical plagues such as storms of fire or darkness, and finally, the 10th plague, the killing of all the firstborn Egyptian sons. 
the Jews were able to escape this plague by smearing lamb blood over their doors, reminding God to pass over their houses. This is the central act for which Passover is supposed to express thanks. The story of Passover is told at Seder, the ritual meal which reenacts the story symbolically, connects it to the world today, and expresses hopes for a freer and more peaceful world. Observant Jews get rid of all their chametz, or leavened foods, and eat matzah and other special kosher for Passover foods during the eight days of observance to symbolize the story that after the 10th plague, when the Israelites left Egypt, they left so quickly that their dough didn't have time to rise for their bread. Perhaps you saw the anonymized Facebook post that takes on the challenge of observing Passover in this time of distancing and decreased grocery store trips. Someone wrote, point, if you're not eating matzah this week, you're not keeping kosher for Passover. Counterpoint. Actually, the principle of pikuach nefesh, the saving of a life, means that it's acceptable to eat chametz this week to avoid going to the grocery store. Super point. Actually, anything that you scrounge together from odds and ends while huddled fearfully in your home consumed by the dread knowledge that remaining indoors is the only way to prevent plague from wrecking death in your community is about a million times more kosher for Passover than anything you've ever eaten in your whole life. After the 10th plague kills Pharaoh's son, after he lets the Israelites go, Pharaoh changes his mind. He's capricious, he's a tyrant, and he sends his army after the Israelites who are leaving as fast as they can. It's a confusing and frightening journey. Just as the army has the Israelites trapped on the shores of the Red Sea, the story says that God intervenes with one more miracle and the Israelites pass safely through the parted waters the army of Egypt pursuing them is drowned when the waters crash back down. Did the Israelites grieve for the army of Egypt? All those people who were following the words of a leader they trusted and then found only death and ruin? Were the Israelites just grateful that they and their families had largely avoided death once again after the terror of all those plagues? How did it feel to go forward into the next part of their lives, remembering neighbors who had lost children? Remembering those nights of fear One way to understand the ancient stories that appear in the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures is to know them as fundamentally human. The specifics of the stories are very foreign to most of us today, but the emotions are familiar. The other story of this time of year is the story of Easter the story of the end of the life of Jesus, who was a prophet like Moses, who continually challenged unjust systems of oppression. Eventually, the forces of empire decided that they'd had enough, and Jesus was tried and sentenced to death. He was executed by crucifixion, and he died on a Friday with three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, and Salome, offering what comfort they could by being present with him 
at a distance. My colleague, the Reverend Molly Hausch Gordon writes, as his breath rattled and his fragile human body began to fail, they kept vigil, offering the small comfort of their presence amid a tragedy they could not halt or control. We don't know if any of his other disciples remained, but the women were there. To the very end, they were there. They watched as his body was taken down and wrapped in linen and placed in a tomb with a large, heavy stone rolled across the entrance. Then they returned home, as they must, to rest during the Sabbath day, as it was commanded. I imagine them pacing as though caged, their animal bodies wild with the destruction of their life as they knew it. I imagine them wailing, keening, resenting that no work could be done to care for the body of their beloved. Or perhaps, they welcomed the day of enforced inaction. Perhaps their limbs felt as heavy as their hearts and they wanted nothing more than to bury themselves in blankets and never get up again. A tweet I read from the Reverend Dr. Emily Heath says, the first Easter didn't happen at a church. It happened outside of an empty tomb while all the disciples were sequestered in a home, grief stricken and wondering what was going on. So we're all going to be keeping things pretty biblical this Easter. The story goes on to say that these three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary and Salome, rose early on Sunday morning. They gathered what was needed to prepare their loved one's body for burial, and they made their way to the tomb as the sun rose. Was the morning beautiful? Did they notice the colors of the sky? Were they worried about their ability to roll the stone aside and open the tomb? Were they simply numb with shock and grief or afraid that they wouldn't have the strength to face the truth of this loss? When they arrived, the story says, they found the stone already rolled back and a strange man was standing there who told them, do not be afraid. Jesus is not here for he has risen. Reverend Molly writes, I imagine they were confused. I imagine they hoped it was true and cursed that wild hope for springing up in their hearts despite all they knew of what they had seen. Later tellings would add Jesus' reunion with the women and with his other disciples but in the oldest known version of the oldest gospel, the story ends here. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They said nothing to anyone, but I wonder if they whispered to each other. I wonder if they asked, what does this mean? I wonder if they were hopeful and afraid all at once. I wonder if they suddenly felt encouraged, a word which means given heart, by this possibility that the violence of empire had not won this possibility that the pain of loss is not the last word. Another tweet, this one from Megan Westra. 
How to faithfully celebrate Easter this year. Only women on the Zoom call. Call is scheduled before dawn. We speak only of impossible things that would topple the empire. A few weeks ago, when there was a lot of talk of opening churches and having packed services for Easter, the Reverend Maria Swearingen wrote this. Easter does not exist to make an empire look better or shinier or healthier or stronger. Easter is not the day we brighten our doors and our organs and our trumpets and our sermon manuscripts in order to display the well-being of systems of domination, hoarding, and inequity. Easter happened in the quiet of the morning and the only thing it demonstrated was that empire did not have the last word. That empire could not destroy people for its own sake. And that empire could not consume people for its own gain. And that empire could not violate people for its own perpetuity. So yeah, I'll take a hard pass on treating Easter like a tool of the empire like the day that we're supposed to make everything look like it's back to normal. How about you? This Christian story of Easter, like the Jewish story of Passover, is about challenging oppression, refusing to accept the status quo, insisting on a world that is fair and just, these stories tell us again, every year, about the facts of suffering and persecution. They remind us that for as long as people have lived, we have had times of fear and loss. We have been creatures who endure hard times and grieve those who die and keep going when the way is unclear. The story of Easter, then, is for me the story of the truth that love endures. We had planned for the choir to sing words from the Song of Solomon today. The choral piece says, set me as a seal upon your heart as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. It's Easter. It's spring. Spring might be the most common way Unitarian Universalists celebrate Easter singing our hymns about the rebirth of life, the melting of ice and the blooming of flowers, and even throwing in some alleluias, like the hymn we sang earlier in this service. This alleluia, yay, flowers, Easter, doesn't feel like it makes the most sense right now. What makes sense to me this year is the story of that dawn the women grieving as they walked to the tomb, the disciples grieving in a house somewhere, everyone painfully, vividly alive and filled with the love that endures beyond death even as it hurts. This being human and alive in the world is complicated. That's why we tell the old stories about fear and grief and miraculous new possibilities. That's why the internet this year is awash in tweets and Facebook posts about how the old stories feel so startlingly close to us now. Then as now, these stories offer us the incredible idea that all mixed up 
in the love and the pain and the fear and the sadness can also be the possibility of real change. The kind that reshapes the world. The kind of change that challenges oppression, that lifts up the most vulnerable. The kind of change that touches each one of us, rooted in the love we carry in our hearts. The kind of change that sweeps out over the land and the sea as inexorable as spring to bring a new day. May it be so. And may we be comforted and strengthened by these ancient stories. chalice where you are, you are invited now to join in extinguishing the flame. We put out the flame to symbolize the end of this time of worship. The light we carry within us into a new day. Please join me in singing our benediction. at a distance. Be well. I love you. <laughs>